How can you tell the end of a nation when the privileged find ways to belittle the suffering of the oppressed? I'm not talking about the seemingly oppressed who game the system. I'm talking about the oppressed. When the privileged disregard the pains of the hurting. When churches are more concerned with the acoustics than the member. When numbers are more important than fellowship. When human social hierarchy places more significance on money and position than on equality and when that social hierarchy takes precedence over human dignity and service. That's when nations begin their decline and ministries start suffering. Don't be fooled by the theme of oppression and think that it's God's people who are oppressed. Amos points out that it's God's people, those who know His commandments, that are the oppressors. Thank goodness that only happened in Old Testament times, right? Right. Larry Norman paraphrases Amos well. If all men are equal, all men are brothers. Why are the rich more equal than others? I'm Andrew Campbell, and this is Sabbath School University. Offering information for your mind. Enabling transformation for your heart. Sabbath School U. A weekly dialogue exploring God's Word and its application for today's world. Welcome to another episode of Sabbath School University. Uh, today we have three first-time guests again. Um, and I'm going to invite you to tell us your name, where you're from, what you're studying, and I want you to tell me one interesting place that you've visited. Um, why don't we start right here on my left. My name is Kevin Bruce. I'm an MDiv student. I'm from Kingston, Jamaica originally. Okay. And um, interesting place that I visited, Hawaii. Okay. Yes. Okay. You have none of the Jamaican accent. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I've lived in the United a, States longer than I've lived. Too long. Yes, yes, <laughs> okay. that's what it is. So, All right. yeah. My name is Jennifer Calhoun. I live in West Virginia, but I'm here at Andrews studying nursing. And the most interesting place I've been, I'll say England. I lived there with my family for five and a half years. Okay, wow. Well, and you don't have an English accent. Not anymore. <laughs> I used to, though. <laughs> okay. Go ahead. And I'm Bill Wells, um, born and bred Californian. Okay. And uh, finally made it to Michigan. Uh, and uh, the most interesting place that I've been to was Tasmania. All right. Close second is New Zealand, right. and uh, spending some time there doing ministry. Okay. And uh, currently, I'm studying theology here in the undergrad department. All right. Now, where's your New Zealand accent? Well, New Zealand was only a short trip, so <laughs> you can't pick up a whole lot there. Okay, okay. Yeah. Uh, well, <clears throat> why don't you read our key text for us and pray, and then we'll jump into the lesson. Definitely. Our key text is found in the book of Amos, Amos chapter 3, verse 8. It says, A lion has roared. Who will not fear? The Lord has spoken. Who can but prophesy? Let's bow our heads for prayer. Our Father and our God, as we embark upon this study of the Bible, we ask for your Holy Spirit to be here. Lord, to enlighten our minds that we may better understand what the Bible says for us today and how we can live it out in our lives so that you may be seen in all that we say and do. Thank you, Father, for being present in our study. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 So this week, our topic of study comes from, like you said, the book of Amos. And uh, the title of the lesson is Lord of All Nations. <clears throat> now, before we get to the meat of that study, Kevin, I wanted um, you to start us off with, uh, you know, the primary objective of God's Word. What is it? Is it to inform, to instruct, to warn, to encourage, to empower? What is, what is the primary objective of God's Word? You know, I thought about this question over and over again, and um, I had two that I really thought about, mm. inform, but, and I also thought about encourage, and I finally decided to just stick with encourage. I think that God's motivating reason for writing the Bible, giving us the word, giving us his words written down, um, is to encourage us. I uh, think about the first four words of the Bible, in the beginning, God, mm. right there, just right at the outset, it lets us know that we're not by ourselves. We're not in this thing alone. You know, the world 
can be chaotic. There's a lot of stuff going on in our world. And right there at the outset, God just lets us know that we're not in this thing by ourselves. He's mm-hmm. there with us. And so we can take heart. We can be encouraged that we're not in this thing by ourselves. Okay. Okay. What do you think? I'd have to say, what's the primary objective of God's Word? Inform, instruct, warn, encourage, or empower? I'd have to say yes. <laughs> I think of, I think of so, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. It says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, mm. thoroughly equipped for every good work. And I found all of those elements in this verse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. What do you think? And, uh, Following up with that, I couldn't help but uh, think of Hebrews chapter 1 where uh, where the author here records in verse 1, God who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets has in these last days spoken to us by his Son whom he has appointed heir of all things through whom he made the worlds. Mm. And so, uh, so I found God's word, the objective, to be His way of informing and communicating with us mm-hmm. so that we can know, like what Kevin said, that we're not in this by ourselves because there is the, the meta-narrative of the, in the Bible that there is, a, there is a battle going on. Yeah. There's a battle for our souls. Yeah. And God is fighting for our salvation. Yeah. That, that, the text that you brought out is actually really a, you know, appropriate because um, we know that God has spoken in the past. And that he's, um, you know, he, we would like to think that he still speaks today. How does, how does that happen? How do you know that God has spoken in the past? And how do you know that he still speaks today? Mm-hmm. And my experience has been um, through just a continuous interaction with the Bible, continuing to study and to read and to understand. And uh, one of the biggest uh, ways that I've been able to, in the beginning of my Christian experience, when I gave my life to the Lord about 10 years ago, mm-hmm. um, was coming to prophecy. So I would say John 14, 26, uh, where Jesus here is speaking to his uh, disciples just before uh, the Garden of Gethsemane Mm -hmm. and his prayer time there, and where Jesus tells them, and now I have told you before it comes that when it does come to pass, you may believe. Mm -hmm. And so how do I know that God has spoken to me in the past is, is through prophecy. It was one of the big things that helped me in my faith, mm-hmm. in my walk with God, and uh, and learning and seeing that God has written these things before so that I can understand. Yeah. So that He, uh, so that I know that He's communicating with me. And then as I've continued to interact with the Bible and read it through and and see how God's Word has changed my life, um, that's how I believe uh, God is continuing to speak because it's changing my life. Okay. Okay. Day by day. What about what about uh, the other two of you. I mean, how, in your own walk with God, how do you see His presence and how do you know that He's real? How do I know He's still speaking to me yeah. through His Word? Well, I do have, like Bill mentioned, personal experience with the Word of God. In fact, actually, just about two weeks ago, I had a really encouraging experience with where God's Word spoke to me. Mm. I had some a personal struggle I was going through and one morning I got up early for my nursing clinicals, went into the bathroom, and my roommate had written me a little note and left it there on the sink with some Bible verses and just said, oh, I hope you have a good day today. I'm thinking of you and praying for you. Uh-huh. So I looked up the verses that she had written on the note, and she didn't know what I had been thinking about or struggling with, um, but the verses that she had written on the paper spoke very directly uh-huh. to the things that I had been thinking about. So God's Word spoke to me uh, in a very direct way way in answer huh. to something that was going on in my life today. Yeah. I remember an incident that I had um, years back now. Um, I was praying about something mm. and um, I was really interceding and uh, not interesting, but just like really crying out and asking God, God, I want you to do this. I need you to do this. It's something that I just really, that was really important to me. I, and I thought this was the world was going to end mm. if this thing didn't happen for me. And I remember I was sitting outside in my car, outside of where I was working at the time, and I opened up my Bible, and there was this little card inside my Bible, and I'd had this card for several months. For Mm -hmm. several months I've had this card, and I always looked at it, it had my name, it had what my name meant, and it had something else, but Mm -hmm. I never really paid attention to whatever whatever else it had. I just knew it had something else on it. And that day I opened up my Bible and the card, and I picked it up, and I saw my name, and instead of seeing what my name meant, I saw Kevin, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not unto your own understanding. Mm. In all your ways, acknowledge him 
and he will direct your path. And right there in that moment, it was God speaking. I believe God was speaking to me, telling me, trust me in this situation. I have plans that you can't even imagine or yeah. think. And, um, you know, the thing didn't work out the way that I wanted it to work out. But as I look back on it now and I see what my life has become because of the way that he's led me, I can truly say that God is very much involved in our lives and is very much speaking to us in this day yeah. and age. I like that. You know, I heard someone once say that basically God's will is exactly what we would choose for ourselves if we knew everything. Yeah. yeah. You know, yeah. You know, going along with that, um, you know, I'll, I really appreciated what Kevin said about how um, the Bible, one of its uh, purposes is to uh, encourage us. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, through my life, I've had to make a lot of decisions and, yeah. and just God's word has really become alive as I've had to weigh through decisions, you know, uh, where do I go to school and what do I want to do with my life? And, you know, we, we've all been there and mm -hmm. I've really appreciated Isaiah 30, 21. Um, and it says, your ear shall hear a word behind you saying, this is the way, walk ye in it. Mm -hmm. When you turn to the right hand or whenever you turn to the left and uh, just God's way of affirming us especially today when, when there's a lot of uncertainty going on, saying, hey, you know what? Um, I will direct you. I will guide you, whatever decision it may be or uh, whatever it may be that's going on in life. Yeah. yeah. And that, that's very comforting considering the fact that, you know, that God tells us in His Word that He knows the future. Mm -hmm. um, why does God reveal the future to us? I think Bill answered this earlier when he read from John 14, 29, okay. where Jesus says, I've told you this before it happens so that when it does happen, you will believe. Uh. And I think that God reveals the future to help give us evidence to base our faith on. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. And you kind of alluded to that, that that was what was really significant to mm -hmm. you in your conversion. Mm -hmm. You know, um, seeing prophecy kind of gives the Word of God a legitimacy that, you know, uh, you know, for, for some people, that's, that's the real um, catching thing about Scripture, that, you know, right. okay, if, any, if anybody can know the future in that kind of detail before it happens, then, yeah, that has to be inspired by God. That's mm -hmm. right. And it just, you know, something you can trust. You know, you, when God says something thousands of years in advance mm. and it happens, you know, it's 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 amazing. You know that you can you can trust this person. It may not make sense sometimes. You may not understand things mm -hmm. sometimes. But he's if he's able to tell something that's going to happen thousands of years in advance. It's it's somebody that you can trust. It's somebody that you can rely on mm -hmm. and know that you know things may not look the way it's supposed to look, but he said it, and because he said it, and it happened thousands of years later, I can trust that and I can mm -hmm. go yeah. with that. And it's just it's amazing to know yeah. that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now. You know, um, for prophets, and we think of Amos, for example, you know, God is revealing uh, future situations to them and, and, um, and He's giving essentially a warning, you know, through His prophets. So sometimes revealing the future is not necessarily just for, the, you know, evidence for faith. It's also a direct purpose, you know, a purpose that has to do directly with your life and your course that, that you're on, you know, talk about that aspect of, you know, God intervening in your life to, to direct your paths because He knows the future and sometimes maybe revealing the future to you in, in a particular way. Mm -hmm. I can start off with a little story uh, in my life. I graduated high school. I was working uh, full-time night crew, grocery store, stock and shelves, mm -hmm. and I was going to college. And my big plan, I was going to be an accountant and a store manager someday of a grocery store. Mm. And uh, one day out of the blue, a friend of mine calls me and says, Bill, I'm going to Mongolia to be a student missionary for a year. And it was at that moment that the Holy Spirit spoke and said, Bill, what are you going to do with your faith? What are you going to do with your life? Mm. You know, are you going to do something to make an impact in somebody else's life mm. for eternity? Or are you just going to go to school for a business degree and, and own and operate a a, a store, grocery store, mm. and um, you know, it was one of those ways where uh, where I know that God really spoke to me. And and as I 
continue and as I spent time in God's Word and and various other things happened and eventually ended up going to a Bible college and uh, started doing uh, different ministry stuff and yeah. um, like God just really brought me face to face with the decision and and with a challenge um, from His Word, especially with Matthew twenty eight nineteen and twenty. Okay, you know, go go into all the world and and make disciples, baptizing mm-hmm. them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things mm-hmm. which I have commanded you. And uh, so, in fulfilling that gospel commission, as God challenged me, yeah, it's really altered my life. Yeah, absolutely. And then um, it's it's also important to recognize that God has a role for each person to to play. So while He may not have wanted you uh, in mm-hmm. a grocery store. There's someone else that he True. he needs in a grocery store because he needs people everywhere. That's right. You know, and so I, I like the point that you know that you made that it's it's his leading in your life that, that God is a personal God, you know, and he can he can tailor his messages for each person. And we see that in the book of Amos. Yeah. The messages that Amos is giving um, to God's people were very tailored mm-hmm. for their. So t- 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 tell me a little bit about that, you know, what is, what is God's message through Amos to, to His people? You know, what, in your study of Amos, and, the, and what are some of the things that you got? It really seems like God is pointing out some of the injustice mm-hmm. that His own people were inflicting on others. Mm-hmm. Um, that was something that I got. God was very directly yeah. dealing with them on that issue. Mm-hmm. You don't generally think of God's people as being the ones that inflict injustice. No, a lot of times we think God's people are the ones receiving the Mm. injustice. Yeah, Yeah, we're the ones that are being persecuted, you know, and it's funny because sometimes you can, the way that, the way that you perceive things, your perspective on on things can Mm -hmm. really, you know, skew the way that you interpret uh, everything. And so, if you want, you can perceive yourself as a victim, you know, you know, yeah. As long as you... It's true. It's, it, that's, it's one of the things that I have to guard myself against. Mm. I find myself continuously, um, you know, being hypercritical sometimes. And I really have to fi- guard myself against being hypercritical because you don't know what a person's going through. And it's so often at times, you know, you've mm. gotten, you know, have an experience with God. You, you know certain things about God. You look at people living a certain way and you want to look down on them because of the way that they're living. And you have to catch yourself and realize, hey, God loves that person just as much as God loves you. Mm, You know, and you don't know their experience. You don't know what they're going through. And rather than being hypercritical, how about you reach out to them in love the Mm. way that God would reach out to them in love? Why don't you be that caring hand, you know, or that person that they can come to and that they can, you know, cry on that person's shoulder whenever they're going through a difficult time. And so... You know, I find myself having to pull myself back sometimes and, you know, stop looking down at people and thinking that I'm better than somebody Mm -hmm. and realize that, you know, I'm in the same boat just as I'm and I'm no better than them just because I may uh, have a relationship with God. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. You know, I was thinking about that, you know, with Amos, you know, going back to a little bit before, Amos did not want to be a prophet. God just kind of put it on him and then he then he took that and. And you know, what, a, what a difficult position that must be in to go to your own people and say, hey, you know, you guys are messing up. You know, you have, you have um, religion with no relationship and, that's, mm. and you're just living a life of rebellion, you know, because you're not connected with God. You know, and so, and so Amos, in, in, in the book of Amos, I'd never really studied the book of Amos much until the last few days. And, um, it's kind of a new revel- revelation, you know, seeing the, the injustice and, and, and God calling Amos, you know, saying, hey, tell my people that they're messing up, mm. that they have, th- sure, they have religion, but they don't have me. And I want uh, repentance, mm. uh, repentance and a relationship, and then religion can follow that. Yeah. But first, I want these people, repentance and relationship. Yeah. You think in, in Old Testament times you had the, the sacrificial system and, you know, God required that they bring a sacrifice. And, and so it was kind of like, oh, well, God, if you require, you know, me to bring one lamb or, or you know, one ox, you know, I can go far beyond that. I can bring, you know, a hundred. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like, oh, I can, is that what's required? I can fulfill that. You know, I can do that. Um, and then missing the, the, the point 
um, the like you mm -hmm. said, the the relationship aspect of it. You know, why is God asking you to bring this sacrifice? You know, because this is this is a symbol that's pointing forward to the ultimate sacrifice, and and you know, basically, that it's because of this whole system that um, that you're supposed to be recognizing God's love and God's mm -hmm. forgiveness, and and this is supposed to really change the way that you live your life and it's supposed to affect other people um, you know that can happen in a similar way today you know you can think of all the re requirements of of religion and, and you you can become legalistic in a sense it's really easy to get um, to have our religion one day a week mm. on our day of church and mm. on those days it's really quite easy mm -hmm. to go and look the part and say the right things and so forth but then not let any of that carry out into the rest of the week. And so I go to the rest of my week, you know, thinking about myself, putting myself first, and that can cause me to treat others in a way that's not Christ-like at all. Yeah. yeah. I remember when I was growing up in Jamaica, there was a song on the radio, and um, I can't remember the artist's name, but he used to, it was called One Day Christians. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it said six days a week they're doing all kinds of wrong. And um, he talked about on you know, the day of worship, they would just, they'd go to church and everything would be good because they're just one day Christians. And we have to be careful that we don't become that, that mm. we're not, you know, we're doing every kind of manner of evil all throughout the week. And then on the, on the Sabbath, we go in and we dress up and we put on our nice clothes and we look pretty and we say mm. happy Sabbath to everybody, mm -hmm. but don't really have the love mm. that God would have us to have for the, our fellow brothers and sisters. Yeah. And, and you know, one of the things that, um, that I think about, it's one, the, the gift of forgiveness from God is wonderful. I mean, without it, we would, it would you know, I can't conceive of, you know, Christian life without that gift. But um, it's a gift that we should never seek to take advantage of or, or you know, use it uh, to, to, you know, to fulfill, you know, like Paul would say, you know, the lust of the flesh. Mm -hmm. um, because even though God can forgive us, sin still has its consequences and so even though yes if if you you know behave in a way that you know brings about injustice to another human being god can forgive you for that but still that person has to go through the the results of of your actions and so um you know um i don't remember who it was but so someone said that you know uh, the the sins of the of the just are almost like more serious than than the sins of the unjust because you know people cer expect a certain a certain sense of righteousness from from those who follow God and sometimes when you see a person who is representing God you know administering evil or or doing evil then it, it becomes particularly more hurtful. Yeah, like like Luke 12, uh, 47 and 48, I was just thinking about this. And it says, And that servant who knew his master's will and did yeah. not prepare himself or do according to his will shall be beaten with many stripes. But he who did not know yet committed these things deserving of stripes shall be beaten with few. For mm. everyone to whom much is given from him much will be required. And to whom much has been committed of him they will ask the more. Mm. And so, uh, so like you were saying, like as God is, um, whatever it may be in our lives, uh, whatever charge or commission or responsibility, um, especially as Christians, mm -hmm. we are to be very aware of the uh, responsibility that we have towards others in, uh, in serving them and caring for yeah. them uh, rather than just continuing on in our way, doing the, the, one, day, the one day Christian thing, mm -hmm. um, doing our thing on every day of the week and then giving God his little portion, you know, in the early morning hours, Sabbath morning, and then we go out and do our own thing after that. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Now, um, it's one thing for us to be introspective and, and you know, d check ourselves. But now when we see things in, in other people's lives that, that need to be corrected, you know, um, what are some of the ways that we can speak out about wrong behavior without being judgmental? You know, because essentially, how can you find a balance? In that. I love the example of Jesus. How did Jesus deal with people's sin without being critical or judgmental? And I think of the story of the woman caught in adultery mm. in John chapter 8. 
where she was brought to Jesus and those who brought her were very critical and very judgmental. Mm -hmm. And first of all, Jesus pointed out to them, don't ever be pointing out the sin in someone else as if you're better because mm -hmm. you have sin in you too. So I think as we approach people who are in sin, it's important to not approach with an attitude of superiority. Mm. Like, yeah. it's okay for me to talk down to you because my sin is much less than yours. <laughs> mm. um, yeah. But I love, Jesus didn't, didn't, um, he, he didn't wasn't accept her sin. Yeah. Right. Yeah. He said, go and sin no more. So yeah. he wasn't saying it's okay to sin, um, but he was rebuking the attitude of superiority Mm -hmm. that the Pharisees were coming with. Yeah. yeah. One of my favorite quotes um, by Mrs. White, she says um, that Jesus mingled with the people as yeah. one who desired their good. And I think if we start from that aspect, that, you know, establish a relationship with mm -hmm. people. I think that's the, the, the one of the key things. Establish a relationship with people and let that person know through your actions, through your behavior, through the things that you say, through the things that you do, that you care about that person mm. and that you have their good at heart. And when you begin to do those things, when you begin to spend time with people and let them know that, hey, I'm looking out for you and I only want what's best for you. When you mm -hmm. approach it, if you see them doing something that you know that they shouldn't be doing, when you approach from the fact that I'm looking out for you. And they know truly at the end of the day, Kevin is really looking out mm. for them. Then they're going to say, you know what? Maybe I should listen. You know, and I've experienced that time and time again um, in my life, you know, talking to people about difficult things because I've established a relationship with them. Mm -hmm. And they know at the end of the day that I love them and I care about them. Um, whenever I say something to them, they know that it's coming from a place of love and not from a place of being judgmental or being hypercritical. Yeah, absolutely. What you've well, done, oh, excuse me. Well, what you've done is you've built a bridge whereupon truth can, can, can be passed over and have built a bridge strong enough to, to, to bear up the message that you are carrying. Yeah, yeah. Very good comments. I enjoyed discussing the book of Amos with you. And, uh, but that's all the time that we have for today. So, um, Erton Kohler said it would, he, he said it well when he said that we should be less evangelistic and more remnant. Because at the heart of being remnant, it isn't about who gets the most, it's about who stays true to God. If you'd like to contact us, please visit our website at www.sabbathschoolu.org. That's www dot school you the letter u dot org don't forget to like us on facebook it helps us to know there is someone out there who's watching this show for sabbath school you i'm andrew campbell and we'll see you next week <laughs>